So hi everyone, um, thank you for attending this, this fifth Young IFSO Journal Club. My name is Moritz Felsenreich, I'm the representative of Young IFSO European Chapter. And today we will have two great presentations and guest speakers. The first one is Professor Praga, the current president of um, IFSO um, European Chapter. He will have a keynote lecture and will also be the guest moderator and will present his experience of um, obesity surgery in patients with really severe obesity. And then um, we will discuss a paper. This is a well-known study, the sleep pass study, and great RCT from Finland. And Professor Paulina Salminen and Dr. Sophia Grünrös will present us the seven-year follow-up data. Um, also, thank you for Medtronic for sponsoring this meeting, and uh, thank you for um, if so. Uh, Michaela and uh, Stephanie De Arco to help us with technical aspects and um, promoting this uh, channel club. Now I will give to my colleague Wai Yang, he will say a few words to Yang Ifso and then we will start with the first presentation and first then also a, a question um, starting in the presentation. Wai Yang. Hi everyone, can you hear my voice? Yes. Hello. Oh, okay, thank you, Daniel, for your kind introduction and organizing this meeting for us. And if you are the first time to be here, please allow me to give you a brief, brief introduction of the Young IFSO Journal Club meeting. And the meeting is initiated by uh, Young IFSO. The objective of this meeting is to provide a platform for young scholars in metabolic and biological field to learn from our seniors and we can also share our research papers, research ideas, and we can also look uh, looking for some uh, collaborative opportunity with one and other. And the meeting is organized online every month on the IFSO platform. So if you are IFSO member, you can uh, receive uh, the notification from IFSO, and you may also pay attention uh, on the IFSO website, Facebook web, page, etc. And also, if you're from China, you can uh, contact me uh, for the details by WeChat. So um, without wasting time, I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, today's moderator, uh, also the presenter, uh, Professor Pergott, please. It's all yours. Thank you for the nice introduction. Before I start, we will have a poll question uh, prepared. And here you see already the question which is the preferred operation in patients with a BMI above 60 kilogram per square meter? So you have five options for the preferred operation. Is it bending, sleeve, ruin Y, OHEB, or SADES? Please vote now. We have around 30 seconds. And then I think we will be able to see the result. Of course, we are all aware that these are challenging patients. And you see, oh, 40% sleeve and 30% SAD yes, 20% RU and Y, and 10% OHEP. So we will keep that in mind and make the same question after my presentation. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. Is it right? Perfect, yes, yeah. we can see it. Okay, Thank you. So just to give you a brief uh, idea where I do come from, this is the General Hospital of Vienna in that square box. And here you see it a little bit closer. It's a pretty huge hospital with more than 2,000 beds. We, are, we have a long tradition of 650 years. We have Europe's largest school of medicine with 8,000 students and 1,500 physicians work here. We do a lot of inpatient cases. You see more than 100,000 per year, more than 50,000 surgeries per year, and so on and so on. This is my personal history. And you can see I started doing a bariatric surgery in 1996. Uh, sleeve now for almost 20 years. And the new kid on the block for me is already also five years old. And this is the SAD, yes. Some of these procedures I don't do or my team does not perform anymore. This is banding and the laparoscopic biliopancreatic diversion. 
So uh, my case mix disclosure, because I think it's very important to know what somebody is doing, not talking about the procedure he's not offering or has no experience with it. Uh, in the last years, especially SADIS gained more and more popularity in our institution. We started doing SADIS in super obese patients, and um, now we extended the indications uh, also to lower BMIs. Still, the most common operation at the moment is OHEB, followed by revisional surgery and Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. We still do quite a number of sleeves, and as I said, SADIS is getting more and more prominent. So, what is about these high-risk patients? In Europe, you have mainly public healthcare systems, which means there is no cherry picking or not so much cherry picking. When you look to other countries and continents with more private sectors, they of course have a different behavior in regards uh, of the choice of the operation. This is a very nice cartoon by Walter Porras. And you see the doctor or surgeon says to the patient, look Fred, you're a lousy surgical risk. I know the operation might, sa might save your life, but I can't do it. It, would, it could wreck my statistics. So the, the message is, who is a high-risk patient? Uh, patients with super obesity, male patients, and older patients. These are statistics, and we'll have a look, a closer look to that. And of course, comorbidities like diabetes, uh, cardiovascular risk factors, especially uh, coronary uh, uh, disease. So uh, just to, to mention it, super obesity is, of course, uh, BMI class above 50 and super super obesity above 60 and this is the the population we are aiming at today. Uh, you're well aware of this tremendous rise in obesity around the world. Now we have more than 670 million people being obese but when you look the most exciting thing is that the very extreme forms of obesity have a disproportionately high increase. This means when we see a doubling in obesity, we might see a tenfold increase in, in super, super obesity, for instance. This is, of course, due to the small numbers initially, but still it is there. So we see more and more often these extreme classes of obesity. And we did also a paper on that on all uh, male 18 year old Austrians where they measured the height and weight and as you can see on the right side uh, obesity uh, has a moderate increase but higher classes of obesity have an even higher increase so and these are more and more patients we see nowadays young patients below the age of 18 you see here for instance a 70 year old chap with a BMI of 76 and the question is what to do with these patients? Do they need special preparation? Do they need a special operation? Uh, or even more, you see here a patient uh, with a BMI of 137. And as you can see, this patient has had already an operation in Doha. He initially had more than 600 kilograms. So uh, you can calculate actually the risk you have to take. Or in these extreme patients, there is a rest risk for these patients. And this comes from uh, an American study. They developed a risk calculator. And in this risk calculator, you have age, BMI, uh, the lung function, use of corticosteroids, and so on and so on. And they look for mortality. And uh, you can uh, calculate the risk uh, for mortality. When you go to this web page, you can put in the data and then get an estimation. And as you can see, the truth is that often BMI 60 on, the risk to die really starts increasing and from 70, 75 on, it increases even more. But of course, one also has to take into account the small numbers of patients here, but BMI 60 on, the risk to die perioperatively really starts increasing. Below, you see the mortality risk is below 0.1%. So the majority of these operations were Roux and Y gastric bypasses and the minority were uh, sleeve gastrectomies, one year mortality after bariatric surgery from the BOLD database. And you can see again that BMI is a real risk factor. Higher BMI is associated with a higher increased risk to die. It is true as well as for Roux and Y gastric bypass, but also for sleeve gastrectomy. And here, the one-year mortality was below 0.25%, 
which is really not that bad data. And when we look into the literature, you see tons of papers that all uh, claim that BMI is a risk factor for perioperative mortality. So uh, another uh, database study from the US, from the MBS AQIP data registry, almost 25,000 uh, patients, and they looked at super, super obesity and uh, super obesity. And at the end of the day, you can see that the super, super obese patients had more comorbidities, which is of course not surprising. And they had a higher likelihood of complication, which echoes the data I showed you before. So the more, the higher the BMI is, the more likely you do have complications and the more likely it is to die from this operation. And another maybe important take home message, which is also maybe not surprising, is that the sleeve gastrectomy in this study had significantly less complications compared to the Ruin Y gastric bypass. And this was true for the super obese and the super, super obese patients. Uh, and if you consider that you make a rather short pouch or you try to pull up the mesentery of the small bowel in a super, super obese patient, there might be more tensions. Of course, the much more demanding operation to do a Ruin Y gastric bypass in a patient uh, with a high visceral fat mass or even in male patients with super, super obesity. But there are other things we should take into account when we deal with patients with super obesity and super, super obesity. And I just want to share you also my own experience with rhabdomyolysis. We had in our hospital two cases. One was referred from another hospital where they did some colorectal surgery that took eight hours and the patient developed rhabdomyolysis and in the end died from that. And the second patient in 2003 uh, with 300 kilograms and at that time the Ruin Y gastric bypass took us more than three hours, less than four hours, and patient also developed rhabdomyolysis. And where does it occur? It always occurs on the buttocks. And you must know that because if you have suspicion, and of course you see that in the lab, if your CPK values go up, then you must think about rhabdomyolysis. And you can measure the pressure in the buttocks with a transducer from an artery, which you use normally on the ICU. And again, the risk factors are here, massive obesity, and of course, a long duration of the operation. Another thing you must also, of course, take into account is how you position the patient, but we'll come to that in a second. So when you look at this review paper, you see BMI is a risk factor, the operative time is a risk factor, and the sex is a risk factor. So male, high BMI, long operation, take care of rhabdomyolysis. And the consequence we took out of these two cases, we uh, used vacuum mattresses after that. And from that time on, we did not see any problems anymore. So this is something I really would recommend using vacuum mattresses because there are good data on that, that the pressure distribution when you use this mattresses is much more even. You have no peak pressure as compared when you put the patient directly on the operating table. Enhanced recovery is another topic. Yes, it is possible even in super and super, super obese patient, but it takes you longer time. As you can see here, of course, uh, a huge difference in the readiness to be discharged and also in the post-operative mobility. But if you inform the patient that they have to stand up, if they are able to stand up before the operation, they are surprisingly also able to stand up after the operation. Uh, of course, there is also in this uh, group, if they do much harder, as, as I mentioned, and the adverse events are higher. But overall, I think, or I'm convinced that this is a group that really benefits a lot of an ERAS protocol. Uh, what can we do or what should we do in all patients with super obesity and super, super obesity? We should put them to a preoperative weight loss program. Uh, this can be either a low carb or low fat diet. And the reason behind that is there are several studies showing very clearly that somewhere between two and four weeks of diet, the liver, the liver volume of your left lobe will shrink by approximately 15 to 20%. And this can play a tremendous important role. It makes your surgery much, much easier. So this is something I really would strongly recommend 
don't operate on a male patient with super super obesity who is not able to lose any weight and how he how will he lose weight if he fails uh, the diet regime we will come to that in a second yeah so you see here again uh, a recent study showing a decrease of almost 20 percent in the volume and others other studies just uh, uh, echoing these findings so the question is of course which surgical procedure what can we expect and there are many many data about the Roux and Y gastric bypass and if you start from a super obese level the take home message is that the majority of these patients will end up with approximately 50% excess weight loss, which is of course for this patient group from a medical point of view, a big success, but many of these patients want to lose even more weight. As an, and as I mentioned before, it might be a much more challenging procedure to ruin why in the super, super obese setting, because you have to pull up the mesentery of the small bowel and this can really be a challenge. So you could think of a two-step procedure. And two-step procedure, you can think about the first step being either a sleeve gastrectomy or an intragastric balloon. What can we expect from the sleeve gastrectomy? Moritz just published our 15 years data. And what we know from the literature, you can expect with the sleeve gastrectomy in the long-term outcome, a drop in BMI points between 10 and 15. That is what a sleeve can do in the long-term run. So a sleeve as a standalone procedure in a super, super obese patient will not work. But we also do have pretty reliable data when you add a second step, either a DS or a SADES. I personally prefer nowadays the SADES. We have very good experience with that. Um, and then you go down to the, uh, in, to, as you would do a SADES in a single step procedure. Intragastric balloon is, is another story. And of course, you can also change from the sleeve, not only to a SADIS, but to other procedures, even to a bypass. If you do that, you would have to uh, lengthen the biliopancreatic limb. Otherwise, you will not add much weight loss or an OHEB, which is, of course, also another option. Um, in this paper by Michel Garnier, you see the sleeve gastrectomy, as I mentioned, for the super, super obese. And you see here exactly what I told you before, a BMI drop of exactly 10 points. And he did a second step, a uh, classic duodenal switch at that time uh, after one year. And uh, you can see that the weight loss in kilogram is pretty the same. Um, with intragastic balloon, uh, this is not very reliable. In, in my mind, the problem is that up to 10% vomit so much that, they have, that you have to remove the balloon before six months, especially in the first week. And uh, it's also a very can be a very challenging uh, procedure for the patient. Either you intubate them, because if you do it under sedation, this is a high risk procedure because you have no safe airway. Actually, we have also experience with intragastric balloons and the sad story is we have had two deaths in the balloon group, uh, one of them in the super, super obese group, and we'll come to that in a second. You see, out of 24 patients, we did a, a balloon in uh, super, super obese patients. We had one gastric perforation, and interestingly, this was not immediately after the balloon was uh, given, but four weeks after that, because the patient ate so much that he perforated his stomach, and in the very end, this patient died from this complication. He had a very long rupture at the lesser curve and was operated by laparotomy and, and uh, then had no kidney function and, and was a very, very challenging patient. And three patients out of these 24 did not lose weight at all. So we stopped doing balloons in super, super obese patients. We do different things nowadays, and I'll talk about that also in a second. Yeah, uh, and these, these are our findings that balloon can also cause complications. They're also echoed by this study. They saw more complications in the balloon group than in the sleeve group. Um, alternatives, here a paper again by Garnier on, and Alfred Pomp's group, early experience with two-stage laparoscopic rheumagastic bypass uh, as an alternative. And you see again, after the sleeve, a BMI drop 
uh, of 13 points and then the, the second stage ruin y gastric bypass does not add so much and you can see these patients end up with 46 percent excess weight loss so maybe the classic ruin y gastric bypass is not the best operation for the super super obese patients they might need a little bit more and what we do nowadays is we try to make a sadi s in all these patients and the truth is if you're able to go to the angle of his then you can also do a sadis in the majority of these patients so that's what we do nowadays except let's say for patients with bmi 80 or above where we have a very thick abdominal wall and you have really problems in positioning the trocars and are angulating a lot for these patients i really recommend doing the sleeve safety first as a single step procedure and then come back after one year and uh, finalize uh, a sadi s why do i like the sadi s more than the classic ds because you have a common channel of three meters we do it with 300 centimeters not with 250 and with 300 you're really on the safe side also concerning protein malnutrition and the other rather nasty side effects especially bloating and diarrhea that the bpd and ds have in common so to summarize already the treatment of patients with extreme forms of obesity think about interdisciplinarity this is really so important you must contact your partners from the very very beginning because your anesthesiologist and also internists must see the patient before you just have to take the risk that cannot be minimized anymore so it's really about optimizing the patient before the operation and of course these are really patients that are very fragile so in for these patients only the most experienced should work on them and you see here my favorite anesthesiologist Edith and she's a fantastic team and for these patients it's really important and this is a liver you you don't want to have you see this is a left lobe in a patient who has not lost, lost weight before surgery it's a very old video i think 2007 but this left lobe is very impressive you see that almost popping out the fat cells out of the liver and what you should do in such a situation you should stop the operation don't go on stop the operation make the patient lose weight and this is what we use nowadays we use saxenda saxenda is liraglutide uh, the, the name for the diabetic patients is Victosa, and there is now an even better um, medication, uh, semaglutide, on the market, which has no permission to be used in obesity, but the data from the New England study that was published just a few weeks ago um, showed more than 13 kilograms weight loss with a once a week subcutaneous injection, so very effective. And of course, there are also some patients that get fed by the family or relatives and these patients if you want them to lose weight you can do this only in in hospital conditions or in in some institution that are specialized on that uh, plus minus metformin yes metformin a very old drug can of course also be added to the glp1 analoga that's what i always already said Preoperative optimization, take only the risk that cannot be reduced anymore. And this includes, of course, also the lung function, which means breathing exercises, try to mobilize the patient if it's possible, and very, very important, inform the patient what he can expect immediately after the operation, because in our hospital, they have to stand up immediately after the operation, and they do these breathing exercises before and after. Positioning of the patient, I told you already, very, very important, using the vacuum mattresses, and then this is no problem at all. You see some impressions of patients with super, super, super obesity. And uh, we use always ramped position for intubation. And you see the patient lies himself on the operating table. He walks into the OR. Of course, this patient gave his informed consent to show that video. He positions himself. I ask him, do you, do you lie comfortable? He says yes. And then we do the anesthesiologist do the intubation in a ramped position. You see, we use two balloons. One is for the surgeons to have a good exposure of the upper abdominal region. And the second one to bring the ear and the sternal notch into one line 
and you see here a medical student doing the intubation. We have not enough time, so I will just uh, go forward and you see very relaxed. They receive all high nasal, um, high insufflation oxygen. And then you have all the time you need. And with the video laryngoscope, I tell them always, even a surgeon could do the intubation. It's very easy. And you remove the guide wire and you see that the patient still has 100% oxygenation. And of course, we do long acting local anesthesia at the trocar sites. And maybe one in fact that is so important in my mind, a short operating time. If you do long operations, the patient really need two, three days to recover. If you have a short operating time, they are fit very fast. No drains, no urinary catheter, no nasogastric tubes, avoid opioids. I think this is already common sense. Stand up after one operation and we start drinking also immediately. So you see here on the right side, the patient with 337 kilograms. He was operated on the 13th of December, was not able to walk anymore. And you see him here just six weeks later approximately. And I call these two ladies our two terrorists. If he faints, then she just puts the, role, the, the help in front and she puts the chair behind. Otherwise, he would bury both of them maybe. And that's, it's very touching. I think this email, you can read it. And he writes, this morning I made my first trip to the River Salzach, walking for 100 minutes with my walking, walking frame being my only companion. And it took him a long, long time, the first time for four years that I walked that far. And so very touching. And you see, of course, this is healthy stuff, but who would buy five huge cucumbers? So we operate on the patient, but not on the brain. So still keep that in mind. And of course, lifelong follow-up. Another patient, BMI, 105, three months after the operation, was not able to walk for the last 2.5 years. Bravo. So this is maybe, you know, that cartoon, the patient, the, the surgeon says to the patient, relax, David, it's just a small surgery, don't panic. The patient replies, my name is not David. And the surgeon says, I know I am David. So there is no need to be afraid of patients with super, super obesity or extreme forms of obesity, but be prepared and think of a plan B. We offer courses for enhanced recovery and also revisional surgery at the Medical University of Vienna. We did more than 100 international workshops with participants from all over the world. But most important, I think, is to say thank you to a fantastic team uh, I'm allowed to have at the Medical University of Vienna. I'm just a small part of this team. This is not the entire team, but this was IFSO Madrid 2019. And uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for attending this fifth uh, Young IFSO uh, webinar. Thank you very much. I think it's your turn more. Ah, we have the poll, the poll, second poll. So once more, let's see if anything changed. So what is the preferred operation in patients with BMI above 60? Still the same question. Give your answer, bending, sleeve, Ruin Y, OEGP or SADES. Let's see if anything changed. I hope you have a small impression about what you can expect from weight loss of the different uh, operations and advantages and disadvantages. So we might see the result. S sleeve gastrectomy even increased. Ruin Y is not there anymore. Very interesting. And also Sadi S increased. So it's, I think this is a very, very good uh, result. Uh, sleeve or SADES, and that's maybe also, in my opinion, the way to go. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Gerhard, for this very great presentation and 
Yeah, I know most of these patients because I have assisted um, in some of them. Yeah, great, great. So um, maybe we are a small group of panelists. Um, we can talk about what are the preferred procedures in, in the other countries for these patients. Alexander? I think me? you have to unmute. Yes, now I hear you. Okay, okay. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all in good health condition. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, we prefer a sleeve gastrectomy for this kind of patients. I think it's uh, it's uh, safer. Normally, it's uh, faster. And uh, sometimes uh, sometime it's... Uh, uh, OEGB can be performed, uh, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, normally it's it's easy to to do the OEGB uh, because uh, it's uh, now it's technical very standardized. Uh, I, I never do the study procedure because uh, I don't like this type of procedure like primary procedure. For the patients, uh, because the uh, exclusion of duodenum for me it's a little bit uh, mm, st stronger than, than enough. Uh, it's our choice. Hmm. And what do you offer after this leave? After the sleep? Uh, yes, because the, the uh, probability that the sleep yeah. is enough. It's very unlikely. Yes, agree. Uh, but uh, we, we can choose. Sometimes it can be OHB, sometimes it uh, can be SARIES procedure. But uh, uh, in cases where when the, um, the sleep uh, with big reflux, it's uh, not so often, but uh, we've seen it maybe two, three percent of the patients, they need a uh, uh, ruined Y bypass. So we have currently seen that the failure rate of, of sleeve gastrectomy in the long term follow up is much more higher. And I think that's our um, experience why we do the SADS because the sleeve um, dilates in most of the person, persons in the long term follow up but they have at least also the bypass procedure where they have only this three meters of small bowel for um, and long, so for have longer time of, of weight loss, yeah. For 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 stable weight loss, that's that's our experience. Why we use this RDS. I would like to ask Paulina, what's her preferred strategy in patients with, let's say, super, super obesity, BMI 60 plus? Yeah, thank you, because I was going to comment, because it's actually quite similar what you just uh, presented, uh, because we most often start with sleeve, so we initially plan a two-stage procedure, and currently our preferred second-stage procedure would be SADIS. And we do that uh, at about a year after the initial sleeve. And we already have the discussion uh, at the start that this will not be enough to start with the sleeve. So you have to be prepared to undergo another procedure. But I, I think, so I, I, our ideology is very much the same with these uh, patients for the uh, chosen procedures. I think uh, an additional thing about semaglutide is that it's really beneficial because it's, it's, I use it quite a lot preoperatively, even for patients with uh, lower BMIs, but of course for the super obese, because you do get some excellent results. And of course, at least in Finland, the one that we have on market is just one milligram, the uh, actual, the higher dose. But when you look at the RCT that was performed on semaglutide the, uh, versus placebo, the dosage was 2.4 milligrams. So it's much higher, but I've had uh, a couple of uh, super, super obese patients that I actually uh, 
used two milligrams, so they had two injections. I said, I'm sorry, you have to stick it in twice, but uh, we don't have the dosage for that. But that actually, and they were able to tolerate it quite nicely. So I think that's, that is a, an excellent tool in the toolbox for us, also for the super obese. Alina, is it reimbursed in Finland, the semaglutide? Because it's pretty expensive in, in Austria. I know. Yeah, that's that's too bad. It's not, no. And uh, actually, this patient had uh, an insurance that he was able to retrieve it from, but it's not reimbursed. So that's a huge issue. I think uh, in Finland, uh, the cost for the one milligram dosage is about 140 euros per month. So that is an issue for some patients. But I no, know I, I think... Yeah, and I think uh, you also have the same experience. I, I sometimes use it uh, even postoperatively for, as we know, you do have a lot of variability of the uh, weight loss and you may have some weight regain. So in order to boost the uh, patient kind of uh, to, again, uh, be able to limit the weight regain and, and again, uh, turn it the other way around. So we do use that also postoperatively sometimes. Can I ask you one more question, um, Professor Simon? Um, what would you do if you plan a two-step procedure? So you do a sleep gastrectomy first and want to do a, a study S after, and then um, the with post-operative the sleep gastrectomy patient um, have some um, reflux. Would you continue go for a study S, or would you then change uh, and go for um, run by gastric bypass? Yeah, I would go for one Y gastric bypass with a with a longer biliary pa pancreatic limb, okay. not just the mm -hmm. standard. So I would what do that. Now? I know. I I knew you were going to ask that because that's uh, that's a tricky question uh, depending on the BMI. But of course, I would most likely aim for uh, 150 or two two meters somewhere around that. But of course, this is it's really not uh, very specific evidence-based uh, choices, but that's what I would do. Uh, do you have a minimum common channel you would aim at? Minimum I length? Think a minimum, I think a minimum would be uh, similar because we've done the studies uh, maybe closer to uh, three meters, but I think I think 250 is the minimum common channel that because if you go below that you will end up having issues later on. Why do you have some experience from China with these patients? Yeah, um, it's really challenging for uh, for many of us handling the super super obese patient and uh, there are many discussion on uh, what one stage or two stage operation for them and uh, I see a lot of paper published that uh, they said some, sometimes they uh, do uh, two stages for example a sleep gastrectomy first or pull up balloon first and lose some weight and go back to other procedures but there are some uh, differences uh, in uh, men in China uh, we usually uh, recommend uh, one stage uh, one right gastric bypass for the patients because most of the patients uh, don't want to uh, come back for the hospital for another operation you know uh, maybe because of the culture the Chinese culture people don't want to stay in hospital and it's a symbol of bad luck and um, then other reason maybe is that uh, most of the operation not covered by the government insurance so the patients have to pay on their own, uh, unless uh, if the patient has some uh, metabolic disorders, for example, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, etc., they can uh, get some uh, insurance covered by, by the government. So uh, in our center, we recommend, highly recommend uh, liposuction and bypass for super obese patients. And the other uh, question is. Uh, we also ask the patient to lose some weight before the operation, for example, lose uh, five to 10 kilograms uh, before the operation. And it seems like uh, a little bit uh, better <laughs> and safer uh, if they do so. Thank you Just very much. Question.
Mr. Gerhard, uh, how many times have you had to stop operating so you actually decide not to operate based on a huge liver? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we can have some. We can have some uh, liver retractor, uh, so we don't worry about the heavy liver. But of course, uh, if the patient can lose some weight, I'm sure the liver uh, size will be uh, smaller. Yeah, I understand. Have, uh, just, I was referring to Gerhard's video. So how many times? That's twice. that's what I was going to say. So you really don't. That's really rare. Yeah, but absolutely. When it happens. When it really happens that rarely you have to keep that in mind in order not to push if it really is that tricky don't do it i think this is a very important message don't yeah. don't be blamed to stop it is not it's better to stop definitely yeah, i that's, agree that's, with you Alina. yeah that's being more professional but that's what i was going to say because you do have a huge experience and if you can recall doing that twice so that doesn't really happen that often and that's why you actually have to remind yourself that that is an option. If it's technically too difficult, you do, you should not do it. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's a very good remark uh, about the uh, liver because uh, we discuss with, the, with our patients every time uh, that in, in the if we see the big liver, we uh, stop the procedure and uh, he go to lose weight it, it's always like this always and uh, it's a very important message i agree completely So let's move on. Yes, I think. <laughs> Microphone. Moritz, you're muted. Just another quick question before we move on to Gerhard. What's your, uh, what's the highest BMI you've operated on? I think it was 140. This, this guy from Doha, had a sleeve gastrectomy by a very famous sleeve surgeon. And uh, he came with a military airplane to Vienna. Uh, and he had at that time 420 kilograms. And we put him to a conservative weight loss program before and then uh, completed. This was already a long time ago. And the question is, what do you do? Which operation do you do in such a patient? Number one, the sleeve uh, was more than one liter fundus left, but it's not to blame anybody. But this, I, I can imagine 600 kilograms is again another, totally another leap. If you do a very malabsorptive procedure, this guy will have several stools a day and he's not able to move himself in the bed, which means he's lying in his own stool. So this, you have to do a kind of compromise. So at that time, I decided to do an OAGB uh, and the common channel was five meters, and I excluded more than three meters because he had a long, a very long small bowel. Um, he was not able to sit before the operation. He was able to sit after the operation, but he could not walk anymore. He was in bed, I think, for more than eight years. So you don't have to expect too much in these very extreme patients, in my mind. Sometimes yeah. it seems to be really too late. Yes, sure. yeah. So thank you very much. I think we go on with the next um, presentation. So um, we have a video of the effect of laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy versus root gastric bypass um, on weight loss and quality of life seven years um, in patients with morbid obesity. And it's a sleep pass randomized control trial. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to see this presentation soon. Thank you very much for Young Ifso for inviting us to present our papers on the sleep pass trial with both five and seven year follow up. My name is uh, Professor Paulina Salmin and I'm from Turku, Finland. And with me, I have my PhD student, Sofia Grönrus, and she will continue with the 
seven year results. I will first very shortly go over the study design and the five year results. And then she will continue with the seven year results recently published this year in JAMA Surgery. To start with, uh, the sleeve pass trial is a multi center equivalence trial with uh, 240 patients and with a mean age of 49 years. The majority were women, as in the majority of trials. The mean BMI was 46, and 42% uh, out of the patients uh, had baseline type 2 diabetes, 35% dyslipidemia, and 71% hypertension. We had a very good follow-up rate at five years, so 80.4%. Of course, as a randomized study, there was no difference between the treatment groups. As stated, this was an equivalence trial. So we had predefined equivalence margin as we were aiming to show and evaluate whether weight loss at five years would be equivalent with laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and UNY gastric bypass. Our primary endpoint was weight loss, uh, evaluated by percent, percent excess weight loss. And uh, as stated earlier, we had 240 patients. For the weight loss outcomes, we did not demonstrate equivalence of percent excess weight loss at five years between the procedures. And this was due to uh, the predefined equivalence margins. And this is one of the study design uh, challenges in assessing the outcomes. And uh, in addition to the sleeve pass trial, there is a similar ongoing Swiss trial with my good friend, Professor Ralph Peterly as the PI. And uh, actually we did have a merged uh, data assessment in both of the RCTs, but now first looking at the five-year outcomes on weight loss, as stated, uh, the percentage excess weight loss was 49% after sleeve gastrectomy and 57% after bypass. A bit better results with percent excess BMI loss as the uh, primary outcome for the SMBOSS trial, but in neither of the trials, there was no difference in weight loss between the procedures at five years. For the SMBOSS trial, it was after adjustment for multiple comparisons. And for our trial, it was the equivalence trial design based on the predefined equivalence margins. So the confidence intervals did not fit in the uh, margins. When looking at our merged data, so we didn't, it's not an individual patient data meta-analysis as it was only the two trials, even though they are the largest uh, trials with the longest follow-up. But in the merged data, we could see that the weight loss was superior after bypass. The difference is about six kilograms. And uh, the hypertension remission was superior after bypass, but there was no difference in type 2 diabetes remission, obstructive sleep apnea remission, or quality of life improvement. And Sophia will get to the quality of life uh, details soon. So this is also a matter of perspective, how you evaluate this. For the merged data, we used uh, superiority assessment. And uh, in the original trial, we are, of course, uh, limited by the original study design, and that's what we have to do the analysis on. But going forward to the seven-year results, and we are currently in the process of, of an, analyzing our 10-year results, but now I will hand uh, it over to Sophia for the seven-year results. Sophia, go ahead. Thank you, Paulina. It's an honor to be here. And yes, as Paulina said, I will tell you about the seven year results. So this was also a predefined assessment point. And because the five year report was so large, we did not have space to uh, assess the more detailed quality of life. So that's why we decided to do it here in, at seven years. And also we assessed the long-term weight loss results and the comorbidities we will assess again at 
10 years. And so here you can see the key points. So the question was, is weight loss equivalence and improvement of quality of life similar at seven years after sleeve and bypass in patients with morbid obesity? And to the findings and meaning, I will come later. So as Paulina already told you, the primary endpoint assessment was at five years. And the objective of the seven year report was to compare the long-term outcomes of sleeve and bypass, focusing on weight loss and especially on quality of life at seven years. So here you can see the materials and methods. So Pauline already told you about the sleep test study. So I will tell about these outcome measures of this seven year report. So of course the weight loss, it was assessed with the percent excess weight loss as at five years. And uh, then the quality of life uh, was uh, measured with disease specific quality of life, which was measured with Moorhead Ardell's quality of life. And then this different health related quality of life, which was assessed with 15D questionnaire. And the quality of life of the trial patients was also compared with age and sex standardized general population. And also the association between quality of life and weight loss was assessed. So here are the results for the percent excess weight loss at seven years. So the percent excess weight loss after sleep was 47% and 55% after bypass. So the difference was 8.7 percentage units. And as noted with the five-year report, uh, the two procedures were not equivalent, but the difference was not clinically relevant based on the pre-specified equivalence margins. So there was actually a, uh, excuse me, a statistically significant difference, but based on the pre-specified equivalence margins was not clinically relevant. And a greater percent excess weight loss was associated with better quality of life at seven years. So here you can see two figures about this. So in figure A, you can see in Y axis, the percentage excess weight loss and X axis, you can see the years. So the two procedures uh, follow quite the same path. And in the figure B, you can see uh, the correlation between quality of life and percentage excess weight loss. So better percentage excess weight loss uh, resulted in superior quality of life and of course, vice versa. And just a quick note uh, for Sophia, because I think it, the point that she made uh, in picture A is very important, as in all of the assessed time points, the difference between the two procedures is very similar. So the trajectory of all the weight loss at all time points is very uh, similar uh, throughout the follow up. Yes, thank you, Paulina. And here are the results for quality of life. So uh, there was no difference in disease specific quality of life or health related quality of life between the two procedures at seven years. So uh, disease specific quality of life was significantly better at seven years compared to baseline in both groups. The health related quality of life stayed higher compared to baseline for the first five years of follow up, but then decreased back to baseline at seven years. And both at baseline and at seven years, the health related quality of life of our trial patients remains significantly lower compared to general population. And here you can see a figure of the disease specific quality of life measured with the Moorhead Arald questionnaire. So, as you can see, at seven years, the disease specific quality of life is significantly better compared with baseline. And a figure of the health related quality of life. So as you can see, it is significantly better until five years of follow up, but at seven years of follow up, it decreases back to baseline level in both procedures. 
And here's a picture of general population comparison. So this is uh, the baseline picture. So here you can see all the 15 dimensions that we have in the 15D questionnaire. And our trial population is um, a bit lower in all of the, or, or at the same level as the population. This. And this is the seven year results. So it's the same thing as in the baseline. So through the follow up time, uh, the trial patients remain a bit lower in this health related quality of life compared to general population. And here is uh, briefly of morbidity and mortality. So the overall complication rate was 24% for sleeve and 28.6% for bypass. So there was no statistically significant difference. And there was no treatment related mortality during the whole seven year follow up. And here is the conclusion in our visual abstract. So at seven years, the percentage excess weight loss was not equivalent, equivalent after sleeve and gastric bypass. So the difference was 8.7 percentage units. And due to the pre-specified equivalence margins, the difference was not clinically relevant. In both groups, the quality of life was significantly better at seven years compared to baseline and greater weight loss resulted in superior quality of life. Then both at baseline and at seven years, the quality of life of our trial patients remains statistically significantly lower compared to general population. So thank you for this opportunity. And as obesity is a chronic disease, we are really looking forward to our 10 year results and we hope you are too. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we're looking forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe I have, I have immediately the first question. Fantastic study, Paulina, great results. Um, Sophia, uh, we see more and more reflux after sleeve gastrectomy. The longer the follow-up is, the more reflux we see and have to convert patients. Did you have the same impression or did you look at quality of life also after reflux? Um, in this seven-year report, we did not do that, but uh, in our 10-year results that uh, we are analyzing, uh, we have uh, this we are assessing uh, the Barrett's esophagus and esophagitis after both procedures. And yeah, we have some results. I don't know if Paulina wants to tell something about those, but. <laughs> yeah, I think the question is very good. And uh, for the uh, specific seven year results, we did not uh, analyze the uh, reflux symptoms. And unfortunately, as you know, one of the limitations of our uh, sleep pass trial is that we did not have the uh, reflux symptoms really that thoroughly recorded uh, preoperatively because at that time it was not really noted that uh, reflux could be such an issue. I, I can tell you that our numbers for Barrett's are significantly lower uh, and there is no difference between the two procedures on the 10 year follow up because all of the patients did undergo endoscopy prior to randomization. So uh, there is a huge difference because the pre prevalence of Barrett's is much lower. But you do have you do have esophagitis after sleep gastrectomy. That's uh, significantly more common. And of course, now, especially when uh, looking at, uh, of course, because we need to also focus on the patient reported patient center outcomes and uh, quality of life and reflux is an issue for that. 
And of course, you do have the weight regain. You will end up uh, with a longer follow-up, which of course also is something that may contribute to uh, the reflux symptoms. So it's not really, uh, it's, this issue is not even, it's not black and white. It's, it's actually quite complex sometimes. But you do have that. And I think uh, for sleep gastrectomy, I think that's an issue we really need to recognize. But uh, I think it's more from a quality of life perspective uh, with the reflux uh, instead of Barrett's. And I think one of the main uh, issues is the preoperative uh, optimal uh, identification of patients that would be best suited for each procedure. So I think you would do need to exclude patients with reflux. And still you will have some patients with de novo reflux, but I think that's uh, patient selection is a key issue here. Yes. Yes, there are Mom? some questions. And um, thank you, Paulina and Sophia, for presenting such a great uh, study. I read mm -hmm. your papers before, and we are also planning to do a similar study uh, in uh, the Chinese population. And are there any recommendations from you uh, for doing a, such a long-term follow-up? In many centers, uh, the patient just don't come back for follow-up after one or two years. So are there any tips on this? <laughs> yeah. I don't know well, what Sophie wants to say, but I think uh, maybe this is a huge issue and I... Uh, the Nordic uh, countries are doing quite well with this because for some reason the people are much more uh, kind of, a, they, they actually come to the uh, control visits. I think this is the same also when you look at, for example, the SMBOS study that has a 90% follow-up rate. So I think uh, that's also culture related maybe. And of course, if people are traveling, so that may be an issue. But as you said, of course, if you do have a long-term follow-up trial that only has uh, 30 to 40% follow-up rates, so you really cannot draw any conclusions on that. Okay, yeah. do you have any sponsorship uh, to cover the cost of the patient for the surgery or something? No. No, it's so the patient has to patients actually pay for uh, the outpatient controls when they come in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's actually yeah, we're actually now when I say it aloud, it actually sounds quite uh, funny, but they do. They, it's it's part of their normal clinical practice treatment. I may have another question. And um, what do you think is the uh, most important factors? affecting the weight loss outcome or other outcomes after seven years. As in your presentation, in your data, you said that um, in each time point, the two procedures uh, look similar, they have similar outcomes. So so I, I, I suppose uh, not the uh, surgical procedure affect the outcome, right? And is it other factors or the lifestyle of the patient after the outcomes, in your opinion? Sophia, go ahead. Um, so uh, did you ask if there are differences like in Finnish population in their lifestyle? Like, yeah, or what could affect that the, the outcomes are a bit different between the two procedures? I think maybe, Sophia, when you look at it, it's a randomized trial. So we did start off with a similar patient population. So I really... There are no uh, explanatory factors or predictive factors that we have been able to find, but of course that would be of interest. And I think uh, this is uh, the room for international collaboration because in order maybe to optimize the patient selection or the procedure selection uh, for patients, we do need large uh, prospective uh, series in order to maybe identify different factors and come up with algorithms to uh, help us to uh, select the most optimal procedure for that patient. Maybe there is also one question from the audience, maybe um, we can answer this. So um, Michelle can you ask, um, there in the combined series, mortality was mostly seen in rheumatic bypass. What about morbidity? 
what about serious morbidity? The first question and the second question was, um, morbidity has been classified between um, major and minor. Um, do we know um, that there are life-threatening GI operations in ruined y gastric bypass over time? So this both questions were asked by um, the Mission, audience. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, this is the uh, the merged data from uh, the sleeve pass and the SM boss trials. And as as said, the we know that bypass is associated with a bit uh, superior weight loss, but the difference is not that huge. We also know from a clinical perspective that uh, when Y gastric bypass does have uh, long term uh, complications, and in the merged data. We use the clavian dindo classification, but modified by uh, by using the CCI index, which actually, in addition to just taking the one patient with maybe multiple complications, the CCI index takes into account the burden of, burden of complications. So that was, uh, bypass was associated in the merged data with almost 400 randomized patients. So bypass was associated with more uh, complications. And these are all Clavian Dindo above 3B. So meaning you actually needed an in intervention for that. But mm -hmm. when you look at the severity of the complications, they were more frequent after bypass. But in our series, there was no difference in the severity. But uh, I think this is, uh, I actually, in a, in a webinar a couple of weeks ago said that uh, I think the more we do research, the I, I seem to be ending up with more questions instead of answers. So, because I think it's really not black and white. You just, you cannot consider just weight loss or complications, or I think it's a composite endpoint ideology that you do need to weigh a lot of things uh, between the uh, individual patients and then actually end up with your uh, best educated uh, assessment of the uh, best procedure for that specific patient. So I think this is maybe something that we do have two good procedures. We just need mm -hmm. to kind of figure out uh, how to uh, choose it for each individual patient. But for Michelle's question, I think those uh, that's that is the answer in our so, and we know that from a clinical point of view. Mm -hmm. Alexander? Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, as we know, the technique of the sleep gastrectomy uh, has been changed. Uh, because uh, 15 years ago, it was the one technique. Now it's uh, very standardized, many. Uh, many mistakes was uh, disappear, and uh, we we know that now it's very standardized. We we choose the patients. We try to choose the right patient. We do the uh, scopy of the upper GI uh, and other things. What do you think uh, the results uh, after uh, the patients the last decade of the sleep gastrectomy? It's, it, it, it will be different between the uh, uh, investigations that now present because it's very important. Because um, my, I think that many reflex it's uh, often um, have a relationship between the uh, the technique of the procedures and the uh, choice of, of the patients. Yeah, Alexander, I fully agree because I think the uh, kind of uh, evolvement that sleep gastrectomy has undergone, I think it's, uh, it is a bit different procedure than it was back then. But I think this also applies to, uh, not in such an extent, but it also applies to bypass. We are currently very much discussing about the limb lengths and I don't know whether the two procedures kind of the standard procedures would be the similar, the same ones that we were doing that. I kind of think for the comparison, because I think there has been an involvement in both of the procedures, so I don't really think that actually changes the comparative assessment between the two procedures. But of course, uh, if we would, uh, there are some issues, I fully agree, because you may have a a technical is issue with uh, sleeve gastrectomy. If you leave the fundus and you have a huge fundus, and that that may be something that a uh, technical point that we uh, don't do. And uh, 
we have seen in some patients, of course, uh, with the revisions, but um, I fully agree. But it's it's a huge hassle to do an RCT, and if we would now do it again and then wait for another 10 years, so we may know something more about uh, optimal link lengths for when Y gastric bypass. So this is always the issue. Like I said, the more you do research, the more you have questions. So maybe we should do that all over again. It's going to be interesting to see the... Uh, the Swedish study, which now currently has about 1,600 patients, the best trial. But unfortunately, the issue there is that they don't have the preoperative endoscopy because I think the reflux issue is very interesting at longer term. But they do have a huge number of patients uh, already enrolled. Yeah, really, congratulations to this very good and clean study. So. Um, this is, I think, one of the um, most important studies um, that we have in this bariatric field. And I think your and the study of Paterly really helps us to, to choose the right procedure for our patients. Yeah. So RCTs are so important and we have so less of them. Yeah. It's a yeah and I, I actually root for uh, uh, international scientific collaboration on this one too, because for example, when you look at type two diabetes remission, we all feel that it's bypass and most likely that may be superior, but that uh, we don't have a trial that actually is able to show that now, but we would be able to do that if we would do an IPDMA on all the RCTs at five years. Now, when we end up having the Dutch trial, we may have the uh, Swedish trial, which uh, doesn't really have the, the percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes is quite low there, but you do have the UK trial. So we would be able to go up to seven, 800 patients with type 2 diabetes and then actually have an evidence-based answer for uh, the different procedures on type 2 diabetes because none of us is able to do such a trial that we would be able to recruit 800 patients with uh, morbid obesity and type two diabetes for the two procedures. So I think this is very important that we do uh, scientific collaboration that will, uh, that will help us and enable us to get more answers. So Paulina, do you have any plan to start an international trial? Yeah, we're yeah we're actually in the process of uh, uh, discussing that we would be doing such an IPDMA, so individual patient data meta analysis on uh, on all RCTs that have the five year follow up because I think it would be really really interesting to see the type two diabetes remission with all the combined RCTs. So I think that would be the way to go because that's the only way we're actually able to have a an answer for that because in order to show a 10% difference in the remission rate, we would need the power calculation is about seven to 800 patients. Mm -hmm. So if you have any new plans, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think every one of us would like to join if you're um, doing such plans. Do we have any other questions? Uh, maybe maybe it, it's questions uh, not for surgical uh, uh, point of view, but uh, anyway, we now we see that we have uh, uh, some uh, medicaments like semiglutide and other, and as I know, the uh, new product uh, now start on uh, market uh, for. Um, uh, stimulator of GGP1 and uh, sure uh, we understand it uh, will be changed the result of our BERT procedure and I think we will we will use it in the future uh, for improvement or stabilization of this uh, operative treatment and uh, what do you think about this perspective and uh, sure I think it's uh, you know, the contribution of the results after that, because when we include the patient and we, for example, uh, give for this patient uh, some um, some semi glutide or something else after the procedure, we uh, change a little bit the um, the situation. 
Uh, what do you think? And uh, well, it's for you, Paulina, and for Gerard. Well, if I start, I think uh, we were discussing semaglutide because I, I use it quite a lot, and I do use it also after uh, uh, after a bariatric procedure, maybe at, at a stage where the patient might experience some weight regain. But I think uh in the in the webinar that we had uh in the international bariatric club two weeks ago uh i think i, I fully agree with lee kaplan that, on the discussion because i think the individual variability of the uh response for bariatric surgery is very interesting because even even with such an invasive uh treatment you do have huge individual variability and if we would be able to predict that I think it would be extremely interesting to do uh, an RCT kind of focusing on the effect of, for example, semaglutide on uh, the individual variability on the patients that are not doing actually that good. Because I think this is not a pro-con uh, assessment. I think it's more uh, that they're actually supporting each other. You may have the surgery and the medication it's not a pro con setting but i don't know gerhard what do you think what's your take on that i fully agree what we see in future is a combination of both of surgery and conservative treatment and especially for the um, glp1 analoga we're just at the very beginning we will see dual and triple agonists in the near future that are even more powerful but saying that it's again a question of compliance are patients willing to inject lifelong and they also have severe side effects. I mean, if you go for semaglutide, I was very astonished that in the in the New England uh, study, as you mentioned, they put it up to 2.4 milligrams. I have several patients that would not stand 1.0 milligram, and 90% of their patients were able to go up to 2.4. So, but I fully agree. I think it's not the question yes or no, but we will see a combination of both. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. I think we had a great discussion. And thank you for both Gerhard Braga and Paulina Salmen and also Sophia Grönres um, for joining our Young If So webinar. It was a great pleasure for us. And yeah, I hope we will see us again in this round and maybe um, next time in, in Prague at the next IFSO meeting, we can also meet us personally if it's, if it's possible. Um, yeah, the next Young IFSO Journal Club will be on July 23rd. Um, it will be a, uh, 8 a.m. at New York time. And we will have a um, very um, interesting paper about robotics in bariatric surgery. It will be um, presented by Dr. Afne, and we will also have George Fielding from um, New York University, who will be our guest speaker and have a keynote lecture there. So I hope um, to see you soon on 23rd of July. And yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.